All right, welcome back to lecture number 96. This is our last lecture with our last historical topic, 9.7 causation in period nine. We're gonna go over all of the key concepts from the period and look at the ways in which the historical thinking skill causation shows up. So our learning objective is explain the relative significance of the effects of change in the period after 1980 on American national identity. And we're going to start with the conservative movement. A newly ascending conservative movement achieved several political and policy goals during the 1980s and continued to strongly influence public discourse in the following decades. So remember, the cause for this conservative movement was the 1964 presidential run of Barry Goldwater. He's the first that's really starting to promote this political ideology. All of the troubles of the 70s with Watergate, the pardoning of Nixon, the Iran uh, hostage crisis really leads the American voters to put the Democrats uh, liberal programs in the past and turn to this new conservative ideology. So Reagan's victory leads to a reduction in taxes, cuts in domestic spending that had been such a big part of the great society back in the 1960s, and also a rise of social conservatism. So taking more conservative stances on social issues like gay marriage, abortion, and Reagan's election could not have happened without the conversion of the blue-collar Democrats who had once been a key part of the New Deal coalition that was a collection of Democratic voters going back to the presidency of FDR. So these conservative beliefs regarding the need for traditional social values and a reduced role for government advanced in U.S. politics after 1980. The presidents that were uh, in office in the 1970s and 1980s, going back to Nixon, also Reagan and Bush, are really important to the Supreme Court because they get to nominate a majority of the Supreme Court's justices. So Reagan and Bush add to that conservative majority. Uh, this more conservative court is starting to put limits on abortion with the court case plant. Parenthood versus Casey. Uh, this conservative court leads to uh, affirmative action being more limited. Gun rights are strengthened in the 21st century with DC versus Heller and then McDonald versus Chicago in 2010. So these conservative policies, not just in the executive branch, but also in the judicial branch, are leading to a reduced role for government. And then based on some of the programs, in laws that Reagan passed, there's also deregulation of businesses and also a reduction in welfare benefits like Medicaid. All right, moving into the 21st century, the nation experienced significant technological, economic, and demographic changes. The technological changes came in the form of the internet, smartphones, social media, and this is going to lead to new economic activity. It's going to help the economy grow. We saw this in the 1990s with the dot-com boom and then later the dot-com bust, but technology has generally had a positive effect on the U.S. economy, helping it grow. There is a decline of manufacturing, and that leads to a growth of service sector jobs. And this disparity between the people who are able to work in white collar jobs and uh, service sector jobs leads to a growing wealth gap. The Great Recession, which happened in 2008 as a result of the uh, subprime mortgage crisis and also the recession created by the coronavirus pandemic are going to hurt these economic groups disproportionately. The people who are already wealthy are not going to hurt as much because of the Great Recession or the pandemic uh, as the people who are working service sector jobs because they're making much less money even though they might be working the same amount of hours. So if they are already living very close close to the poverty line, one missed paycheck or um, being laid off is going to be more detrimental to those groups. As far as demographic changes for international migration, the 1965 Immigration Act had led to a growth of immigration again. You see the chart on the right, you see that, you see that there's a uh, continued or there's a dip as it goes into the 1960s and then um, we are coming out of that valley to the point where the percent of immigrants in the United States that are foreign born is just about 16-17%. 
And um, the immigration levels uh, will not rise to the pre-1920s level again. Uh, about 12% of the population 12% of the population is foreign born. So for technological developments, we have them in science and technology. They're going to enhance the economy and transform society while manufacturing is going to decrease. So companies like Google, Apple, Silicon Valley companies, they're going to lead the way in these new economic sectors. Uh, they're going to be more white collar jobs and the blue collar jobs of manufacturing are going to start decreasing due to outside competition, also due to some free trade agreements that we sign that are going to allow companies to send their manufacturing operations abroad where the labor costs are going to be much lower. The economy is going to shift to tertiary and quaternary economic activity. These are uh, service level jobs, the tertiary ones, and then the information industries are the quaternary. That would be the more white collar jobs. Those higher paying jobs are going to re require a higher education, which is going to contribute to that growing wealth gap. Not everyone is going to be able to pay for that education, like four years of college, or uh, is willing to put themselves into large amounts of debt to pay for those four years of college. So the US population continued to undergo demographic shifts that had significant cultural and political consequences. Uh, the, nor the South and the West are the, one the areas of the country that are going to have more people moving to them. And the cause for that is lower taxes, friendly business, business environments. Um, the increased population in those southern and western states is going to cause an increased significance in elections. Remember, in the 2000 presidential election, the state of Florida was the key to the presidency of George W. Bush. There was a difference of less than 600 votes in the state of Florida. For the international migration, that increased amount of people coming from outside the United States is going to lead to cultural blending, a rise of new foods, language. Roman Catholicism is going to rise in the United States because a lot of international migrants are coming from Latin American countries where Catholicism is the main religion. And we're also going to see a rise of illegal immigration. So the attempts of the government to curbing um, illegal immigration is going to be the Immigration Reform and Control Act, or IRCA, in 1986, which is going to try and shift the burden to private businesses, make sure that they're the ones that are not hiring undocumented workers. It's not going to be effective because the number of undocumented migrants is going to continue to rise from the 1980s to the present day. All right, the end of the Cold War and new challenges to U.S. leadership forced the nation to redefine its foreign policy and role in the world. Um, in 1991, the Soviet Union dissolves, and now we have to think about uh, dismantling all of the weapons that we had built up through the entirety of the Cold War. So we start signing the Starch Treaties, one and two, with Russia, who are go is going to have the majority of those weapons that were held by the USSR. Um, the U.S. is going to lead the war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the allies that we have are going to grow weary of our intervention abroad, especially in Iraq, because we don't gain the consent or the approval of the U.N. Security Council when we lead that invasion. And we recognize that the world is going to be a better place if people get along, if there's no threat of terrorism, and um, in trying to increase this global cooperation, the United States is going to keep its leadership positions in the international organizations like the UN, NATO, and also the G8, which is uh, the eight largest economies and leaders of those countries. They get together once a year to talk about the issues that they foresee as being the biggest problems or the biggest challenges moving forward. All right, so the Reagan administration promoted an interventionist foreign policy that continued in later administrations, even after the end of the Cold War. So communism continued to spread. That's going to cause the United States to contain pro-communist uh, governments in the Western Hemisphere, or they're going to prop up 
pro-U.S. governments in Latin America and South America, even if those pro-U.S. governments may be undemocratic or authoritarian. So an example of that is Grenada, uh, the island in the Caribbean. We went in there and we stopped the pro-Castro regime from taking control. We're also aiding the Contras in Nicaragua, and we're using the sale of arms from Iran to fund the Contras to fight against the Marxist Sandinistas. That's going to lead to some trouble for the Reagan administration. And George H.W. Bush, after Reagan, is going to continue this interventionist policy, is going to intervene in Iraq after they invaded Kuwait. Um, and then Saddam Hussein, who was in power then, is going to be removed by George H.W. Bush's son, George W. Bush, in the Iraq War of 2003. All right, so following the attacks of September 11, 2001, U.S. foreign policy efforts focused on fighting terrorism around the world. The 9-11 attacks led to a war on terror. The United States had experienced terrorist attacks around the world in embassies. Uh, we had obviously experienced the 95 Oklahoma City bombing, but nothing to the extent that we saw in the 9-11 attacks. Uh, if anything, the 9-11 attacks were so much more visually striking because of of um, the buildings that were taken down as a result of the attack. And so this becomes the new U.S. priority. And we begin by overthrowing the Taliban in Afghanistan, who had been harboring Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. The Bush administration tries to um, allege that Saddam Hussein in Iraq also has ties to terrorism and is trying to develop what weapons of mass destruction to give to terrorist groups. And the unrest and power vacuum from the Arab Spring and the U.S. invasions that led um, that the U.S. invasions that the United States was leading in order to help those democratic movements leads to the growth of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria or in the Levant. So the civil war that was going on in Syria against the authoritarian president was allowing this terrorist group to take control of certain towns in Syria and also the weak government in Iraq that had uh, been a result of the U.S. invasion was also getting taken over. You see on the right side all of the parts of Iraq and Syria that ISIL held. All right, so that is it for our last recap of our last lecture. We have the conservative movement came to power in 1980 with Reagan's election, and conservatives generally wanted government's role to decrease. Technological changes impacted the economy, and demographic changes impacted culture and politics. The U.S. continued to be deeply involved in other countries as part of its Cold War policy and beyond. So the U.S. had to find a new purpose in its foreign policy after the Cold War ended. And finally, the war on terror became a new foreign policy objective after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. All right. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you have learned a couple of things as you've gone along. Please stay tuned as we will continue doing some review videos as we get closer and closer to the AP exam. So thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.